Just very briefly about the Centre for Development Impact. It's a new initiative. It's a joint initiative uh, between the Institute of Development Studies, a number of fellows here, and ITAD, a group of cons consultants and practitioners in evaluation, have been doing evaluation for 30 years, just down the road in Hove. So it's a joint initiative exploring um, broadening approaches to impact evaluation, looking for approaches appropriate to context and different types of complex intervention, and also looking at the realities of the, the process of um, evaluation. And I think this, this was certainly very interested and, and welcome this kind of co-hosting arrangement here. Um, theories of change used a lot in evaluation, sometimes not very well, and sometimes well, and we hope to hear more about how it could be used to be more empowering as well, not just as a, a tool or a technique. So, thank you, Bob. I'll let you take the stage and, and lead us through it. Thank you. sell 
prototypes, people started to build it in, in, in different countries, um, including Burma. Um, so, and this was sort of 1994, 95, and Slork was in power. And Slork, being a military hunter, had decided that, um, yeah, uh, rice farmers in Burma can grow two crops of rice a year, and they will grow two crops of rice a year, but that we understand enough about rice and the growing season that to harvest the first crop, it will be in the middle of the rainy season, and they won't have time to do it by hand, so they'll need a machine. So they task the agricultural machinery department to go out and um, design, find a machine for them. And it just so happened, that I don't know how they, they, they got their hands on it, but they got their hands on the, the drawings of, 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 my, of my harvester. And they built a prototype in record time, just two weeks, they built this prototype and they they videoed it and they took it and they showed it to Slork and they said, right, okay, we want 2,000 of these and they will be built within two months. And that's what started to happen. I heard, went out and heard about it and um, found that they were building these machines which had no chance of ever working because um, they had substituted um, thin wall pipe, whether it should have been high tensile steel rod, etc., etc. And um, I, I was worrying that, it, that none of these things would work and they would go out and um, there would just be so much, um, so much uh, junk. And that's actually exactly what happened. They all went out to these tractor stations and that's where they ended up. They were useless and everybody yet knew they were going to be useless. Um, but then, just off the picture, there was last year's machine that had been built through the, by this um, mechanism, um, which was a pedal, pedal thresher. And next to that was the machine from the year before. And, and so that here was this system that was building these machines that were going to the tractor stations and then were not, was not being used. Um, but the system thought that it, what they were being used. Um, nobody was sending any negative information back up. Um, it was, it was, and it seemed to be that it was in most people's interest just to keep this false narrative going. And, and I was wondering, so where did this come from? I and mean, why is it like this? I mean, it's such a tremendous waste of resources. And it was realizing that it was this whole system was set up with a, with, a, with a model that was wrong. It was assuming that was, was a model that was based on rice and, and breeding new rice varieties. That the scientist, the engineer, can produce the technology that can just be thrown over the wall, can be given to the farmer, to the tractor station, and it will work. And there's no need for any feedback or local ad adaptation. And I, I, I realized then that this was just such a stark example of how these impact pathways matter. These mental models of how we think change happens really matter because you can have whole national programs set up um, based on these false assumptions. And then, um, particularly when you're in a nasty regime where people are scared to give feedback back, they get set up, they're put in place, and then um, you end up with such tremendous waste of resource as you see here. And then realizing that while this was a very stark example, these sort of things were happening time and time again. People using the, the wrong, you know, not questioning the basic assumptions under, underpinning their programs and their, and their projects. So this was a real formative experience for me and I guess from, from then on, the most of you know, my work has been about how, how can we make these mental models explicit? How can we help people question these underlying assumptions? Because if we can, then we have a chance to improve the way we do research uh, and that link between research and, and development. Um, because we also 
work with mental models. When we do our research, and particularly in the CGIR, we are very much concerned with doing research for development, research in development. We want to map out, we, we want to see how what we do is going to make a difference. So these mental models matter. So, okay, so that they matter. How, are we, so just to kind of put what I'm going to say now into, in, in, into a bit of a framework. Um, so the outcome is that we want to get people to think about their mental models and as a result plan projects, programs that are more likely to have a positive impact at the end of the day. Okay, so that's, that's the outcome that we want. And, and, and this draws from a, from a framework of, uh, by Corson and, and Tilly, realistic evaluation. So you've got the outcome you want in a context, and then there is a, there is a mechanism which you can trigger with your intervention. And it's this mechanism that can, uh, in our case, what we want the mechanism to do is to get people to think and engage and change their, their mental models. Okay, and um, unpacking this a little bit more, the way um, we've been going about doing it is we want to make an, an approach which makes these mental models explicit. So to get people to, to actually take their theory in use, how they think the world works and make that explicit, um, then reflect on its validity, do the way people think things are working, does it match with what's actually happening? And as a result, you narrow this gap between people's theory and use and the espouse theory. The espouse theory is just a, another term for the of, of what you see written in project proposals and programs. How we say to others, we think change is going to happen. Um, and just to go, again, uh, dig into this mechanism of uh, looking at it through a systems perspective, um, what we want, so what we want to do is we want to dig down. People, you know, we generally see things happen um, and you have a knee-jerk reaction. So you, you see all this waste of machines in these tractor stations and you know, your, your initial reaction is, gosh, what a waste, we've got to do something about it. And, and then you dig down and, and you understand and you, know, it's, you understand why these things are happening. People are scared to give negative information back up the system because Country is ruled by a military junta. Yeah, you, you get into the structure behind that, and then this the mental models which are underpinning all of it. And so, what you want is an, a, an approach that can actually get down, get down to here, because then you can transform things. So, in terms of intervention, um, the first thing first intervention to, to try and sort of tr trigger this mechanism to, to, to make these mental models explicit um, was the use of innovation histories. And so I did my PhD uh, looking at case studies of the early ad uh, adoption adaptation of this stripper harvester which I just showed you and some other post-harvest technologies in, the, in, in, in Southeast Asia. And it, and digging down and trying understanding of these processes, it was fantastic for me. Um, I got a PhD out of it. I then wrote wrote a book based based on that. And for my own learning, it was it, it was it was brilliant. But on reflection, um, yeah, it. Writing the PhD is a very, it's a very personal thing, so you're not changing other people's mental models when, when you write a PhD or, or a book. 
Um, not directly anyway. So then I thought, well, okay, um, can we build these histories together? Can, can we unpack innovation um, processes looking backwards and through exploring together how this change happened, <coughs> can we um, collectively begin to, to change and some of these um, assumptions that underpin the way we actually act. And did some work, work on that. Um, but to be honest, there, there was, there's not a lot of budget or interest in looking backwards. Um, I think innovation histories are, are great and we should do more of them, but um, they, if you can do them collectively with people, then they will work. But when you are looking backwards at innovation, there is a lot of, there's a narrative often that's developed, which you have to then challenge, and there's politics involved in that, and just people's interest. And it's this idea that the, the rear view mirror is smaller than the windscreen. You know, people have, there's much more interest looking forward than looking back. So having started with working on innovation histories and, and getting a bit frustrated that, you know, that this, this wasn't, wasn't a lot of uh, resonance with this, um, it just so happened that a project came along um, which I had the opportunity to design, to lead, and it was to work in the Challenge Programme on Water and Food to do some ex-ante impact assessment. Um, basically, this is a, a programme about uh, 12, 12 million dollars a year um, over, it was over, over 10 years, so a reasonable budget but working in some of the mega river deltas in the world and claiming as impact that it was going to have some measurable impact on the Millennium Development Goals. And that's what they're claiming in the proposal and that's what they wanted a narrative about to sort of, okay, so how are we going to get from our eight projects in the Volta and our ten projects in, in the Ganges how are we actually going to tell a plausible story about having some measurable in, uh, impact on the Millennium Development Goals? And so they brought, that, that was the, the challenge for this particular project. And um, I was thinking, well, how are we going to do this? And realizing that one way of doing it might actually be to tell stories into the future. I've, I've had some experience with uh, appreciative inquiry and this idea of visioning where, where, where you wake up five, ten years in the future and you tell the story going, going backwards. So, so I, I sort of did a flip and, and, and said, well, uh, yeah, I know how to do these innovation participatory in, in, uh, innovation histories. How about we flip it and we start writing these stories into the future? And if we can get these projects to begin to think about the sorts of impacts they can have, then maybe we can tell a plausible story about how we might um, have impact on these, on these Millennium Development Goals. So, so that was how PIPA, Participatory Impact Pathways Analysis, was, was born. And... Um, it draws from uh, a, a variety of backgrounds, uh, heavily from program evaluation, um, from which theory of change has come, from innovation histories, appreciative inquiry, and a big part on social network analysis. Um, the, the main artifact, I've been in this room the last two Days and one of the words I've they used a lot there around monitoring the evaluation was artifact. So um, <laughs> uh, I've learned that word. 
one of the main PIPA artifacts is a, <coughs> is a workshop where you bring people together in, in a project, in a program, um, best done at the beginning when you're planning your, your program, and you take them through a process to help them make explicit their impact pathways, how they think what they're going to do is going to make a difference. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through some of these stages with you. Um, but it's basically two parts to it. There is a, a, there's a problem analysis, and, and that starts with a problem tree, and that gives you one picture of, it starts to get people thinking in terms of causal pathways. And then there's a second part to it, which is the stakeholder analysis. So who are the actors who, who, who need to be involved, and how do they need to change to achieve your vision? And that's a lot around network mapping. And, and then the third part is you start to put this together. These two views of how change can happen, you, you, you integrate it. So there is um, that's a picture of people constructing a, a problem tree. Um, typically the way you do it is you bring um, well, we've, we've done it in two ways. When you've got a program made up of several projects, you bring representatives from the project teams together and collectively they develop their project impact pathways and then you share them as a way of bottom-up building a, a collective understanding of what the program is, is achieving. <coughs> the other way we've done it is for one project, you bring together the main stakeholder groups and each stakeholder group goes through uh, constructing a, a problem tree, uh, the network mapping, and then the different stakeholder groups share their different um, theories of change, <laughs> and you compare and contrast. And it's very people appreciate understanding how you know farmers appreciate how the, the researchers see, see the project, and, and, and vice versa. Um, here is drawing network maps, um, and yeah, you, we've just in these workshops we we end up uh, we, we hit upon just four relationships: uh, who's funding work in the area, who's doing research, and then the scaling out and scaling up is about how information knowledge is is spreading. Horizontally, and then the scaling up is more about political influence. Um, then we get into the power towers, um, showing, it, getting people to think about who has power in these networks and whether they're for you or against you. Um, and then that brings you on to okay, so there's a very powerful actor who we think might not get it, or may actually be suspicious of what we're trying to do. So, uh, what, um, if in the future, so, so we also get, uh, I should have said, we get people to think about their future networks and how the networks need to look like in the future to achieve their vision. So, in, in the future, for the project to be successful, this actor would need to have developed a better attitude or understand and be supporting what we're trying to do. So, um, so then you articulate, well, what are we as a project going to do? What's our strategy for engaging with this politically important actor? And, and, and so on. So you begin to identify through this process the, the actors and um, how they need to change for the project to achieve its vision. And then, as a way of integrating with, there are various ways you can do that, but in the challenge program on, on water and food, where we started, to, we started to use this then as the basis for the monitoring and evaluation system, and we started to systematize it 
we, we came up with this thing called the outcome, outcomes logic model. And so here you have, you, you identify these different outcome pathways. And an outcome pathway is identified for a particular actor. So you've got your politically important actor, they, the change in behavior is, and you specify that, and it's basically to be supportive of uh, what you're trying to do in your project. Um, then you start to specify, well, yeah, what do they need to know more of? Um, what's the attitude change really if they're to be more supportive? What, what have they got to get? And, and then you start to articulate what you're going to do in your project to bring those changes about. And then, and, and, and then you unpack it even further and you go, what are the outputs? So, so, so what are some of these artifacts, a publication or a communication um, um, campaign or something like that? And, and then to sort of top it all off, you write a narrative to explain to unpack some of the uh, assumptions which will underpin the logic of this of, 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 of this row. Um, so yeah, if, if you remember that's what that's how you do integration of these two these two views. Okay, so <coughs> very quick on, on PIPA. Um, to reflect on now on how it worked, um, because having worked with these workshops and, and, and getting people to articulate their theories of change, I said we worked in, in CPWF, in Chamber Program on Water and Food, to then instrumentationalize it and to um, use use these outcome logic models as the basis of, a, of an M&E system. Um, PIPA really does work well, and this was written in providing this space for reflection. People do appreciate having the time and space to think, think about <coughs> how what they're doing is going to make a difference. Um, at least in the projects I've been working with, most people find that quite mot motivating to, to think about a vision, to think about how they can be more useful. Um, and, and they find typically that uh, yeah, other people have, have been thinking the same things and a, 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 co a comment that I've got back several times is, you know, this is great, but this is the stuff that we, I've been doing, but I've been doing in, in the evenings or at the weekends, because it, it's, it hasn't been valued before. Uh, it hasn't been seen as part of you know, the usual project or, or research, research process. It, it's worked well in providing a language and a set of uh, concepts to link research to impact. And, and this conclusion comes from a recent survey done of the projects we worked with in the Chan program on, on water and food. Um, but the thing they liked most about people about impact pathways was that it, it yeah, it helped change the way people thought about their projects and thought about linking research to, to impact. The other Thing that's worked well is that um, the CGIAR is going through this change process. I think the fact that a number of us have been working on this and have had experience, hands-on experience with theory of change, with, with impact pathways, has helped now cement um, theory of change firmly within the new performance measurement system that's been put in place in the CGIAR. So there's the expectation now that when we set our targets, we need to build these, these plausible narratives. We need to articulate our impact pathways to show how we're going to get, to get there. And, and, and within this is the idea that 
um, these pathways are uncertain and they evolve and you need to be able to, you, you need to be able to change them. Um, what hasn't worked well is when was making these outcome logic models at a contractual requirement. So what we did in the program, we, we had this sort of happy, you know, a created space where you bring people together and they construct their pathways and um, they, they, they tend to be quite optimistic and uh, aspirational. And then you say, okay guys, turn that into something which you're now going to be judged against. And um, yeah, people sort of <laughs> react, react against that. Um, and part of that is to do, to do with timing. <coughs> and if there's one thing I've learned through all of this, it's timing <coughs> how you use these tools is critical to whether they're seen as a force for good or a force for bad. Um, and at least with research projects, that you, yeah, their theories of change really do evolve over time. And you don't want to push people too early to be too definite about their impact pathways, their, their theories of change. Because with a research project, you, what will get picked up and used will depend upon your initial research results. So people don't, often don't quite know what pathway they end up going to go down. So don't push them to develop the metrics for a whole number of pathways when, in fact, if you leave it six months a year, projects bedded down, they'll say, well, look, you know, we're doing a little bit here, a little bit there, but actually where we really expect to make, make a difference and, and, and where we want to understand what's going on is, is on this pathway. And, and then that's basically what they monitor. So... Um, yeah, it, it's it's about it's about timing and it's about when you ask people to identify and refine their milestones. Don't don't push it all up into here. Give people time and allow flexibility. My last slide, just then the the next steps for for PIPA. Um, well. For me, anyway, it's revive PIPA. PIPA is something which I've worked on, and I, you know, with, 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 there's a website, but we essentially haven't done anything with it for about three or four years. And um, so there's a, there's a lot that's happened around it, and there's a, there's a real need to sort of, uh, yeah, there's, as there's an increasing interest in theory of change and doing it in a participatory way. Um, real need to kind of update and pull together what the people who have been using PIPA have been learning uh, because it's not in one place at the moment. And so part of that is there is a kind of a, an emerging community of practice and I, and I guess with, you know, with steps as well. So how do we share um, good, good practice and and what, what doesn't work. Um, and here I'm mindful of, uh, you know, with most significant change, a mechanism there that was really helped with, um, was essentially a, a list server and um, Rick Davis supporting um, and, 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 and giving feedback and that keeps, that that kept the momentum going. Um, be interesting to now measure some of the impacts of. So this has all been about changing people's mental models, but we don't have a lot of hard evidence about whose mental models have actually changed and to and to what effect. Uh, anecdotal, but um, it would be good to get a bit more of a handle on that. Um, in, so now I'm working in this, in, for World Fish as part of this research.
research program on aquatic agricultural systems. And we're going to be using people or a variant of it extensively now um, in, in, in our own program. Um, I'll be very interested to learn more about how it's being used in, in steps. Um, and yeah, linked to this, this idea of reviving people and community practice, I'm very interested in exploring with, with, with you possible collaboration in, in this.